You're about to take a full IELTS listening test with all of the same questions and sections, just like on the real test. If you're taking the IELTS test soon, I highly recommend you practice with this video because a lot of students struggle on the IELTS listening test. And it's mainly because you can't make many mistakes if you wanna get a high score. If you look here at the scoring criteria, you can see that you can't make many mistakes if you wanna get a band seven or above. So that's why practicing is so important and that's why I make these videos for you. And if you would like me to keep making these videos, give this video a big like and subscribe to this channel and then I'll make more ones just like this. Okay, I hope this video is helpful. Oh, quickly, one more thing. The answers for each question come at the end of the section. So there are four sections on the IELTS listening test and the answers will be at the end of each one if you wanna check them first. Okay, that's enough from me. Now let's start this test. Good luck and I'll see you at the end of the video. Part one. Listen to the conversation between your friend and the rental agent and complete the list. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to seven. What about the one on route 9N? It looks like it's big with a library and a deck, but it doesn't say how much it costs or anything else about it. Oh yes, Mrs. Gaylor's apartment. That one is actually only a 10-month rental and it is going for $156 per week. It's quite a nice place. She only rents for 10 months each year because of horse racing season. Then her relatives all come to stay, so tenants have to move out. It's a little bit inconvenient, but past tenants have really enjoyed their stay there. Oh, well, we need it for a full year. I guess that one is out. How about the rental on Brougham Drive? How many rooms does that one have? As it says on the list, it has two bedrooms and a private kitchen and bath. But it's actually a very small place. That's why it's a bit cheaper. Oh. Well then, what about the one that has three large rooms? Who is renting that property? That one is a good deal. Mr John Smith is renting it. But he's quite eccentric and he has a strict rule about no pets. How about cats? Nope, absolutely no pets. Hmm, well then, how about this studio apartment rented by Mr Bo Jensen? How is that one? That ad is actually a bit deceptive. The studio apartment is the whole upper floor of an older house. It's actually very large and, at $45 a week, quite affordable. And it's near campus. I think I'd like to check that one out. Do you have a telephone number that we can call? It's not on the list. Oh, it isn't. Here it is. You should ring area code 518 and then 543-7790. Thanks. I think I'll call on that one first. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Hello? 1512, Route 9. Yes. Is this Mr Jensen? Yes, it is. Can I help you? Yeah, we're studying here at university and we came across the rental information for the studio apartment that you are renting. Is it still available? Yes, of course. I actually just placed the ad and you're the first person to call. Is there anything you'd like to know about it? Yes, actually there is. As students, we are on the internet a lot and we heard that some homes in the area have high-speed connections. What type of connection do you have there now? Oh, <laughs> That's an interesting first question, but I guess I have heard that too. But we just have a phone line here, nothing fancy. I think you can have a cable line installed, but it's just a phone line for now. OK, well maybe we can do that. What type of heating does the apartment have? Now there's a more traditional question. We have oil heat here. It's an older house. 
That tends to be a little more expensive during the winter, right? Yeah, but there's nothing to do about it. It would cost too much for me to put in a gas heater. What else would you like to know about the apartment? Well, we heard it was quite big. Is it furnished? Actually, yes. I should have put that in the ad. It has an old couch and a couple chairs, a dining table, refrigerator, stove, and even a dishwasher. Does it have any beds? Yep, it has two. That sounds great. When is the apartment available? You can have it tomorrow night if you want. I just have to clean up a couple things before you get here. Do you want to come over and see it first? No, it sounds fine to us. I actually know the street too, so I know the area. We'll take it. That is the end of part one. Part two. Listen to the guided tour commentary and answer questions eleven to twenty. You now have some time to read questions eleven to twenty first. Welcome to the library tour. We'll begin our tour of this level of the library here at the entrance. Then we'll go in a clockwise direction. So, first of all, over here on the left, next to the entrance, is a touchscreen information service. These computers can be used at any time to get general information about the library and how it works. In front of the touchscreen information service are the catalogues. As you can see, it's a computerised catalogue system, and it's very easy to use. The catalogues are linked up to the other libraries at the university, so make sure you check which library a book is in when you are trying to locate a particular item. Next, along here on the left, we have the circulation desk for borrowing and returning books. The returns area, the place for returned books and other items, is at the end of the circulation desk near closed reserve. Closed reserve as most of you probably know, is a collection of books that are in high demand, so they are on restricted circulation. If a book is on closed reserve, you can only borrow it to use within the library for three hours at a time. Over there in the corner are the shelves for newspapers. The library has an extensive collection of local and international English language newspapers. They are kept on those shelves for one month, and then stored elsewhere. As we continue on our tour, around to the right, this large central section is the reference section. Reference texts cannot be borrowed for use outside the library. They must be used within the library. All these shelves in the centre of this level are the reference section. Now, the stairs here on the left lead to level two only. On level two, are most of the law books. To go up to the other levels of the library, you have to use a lift. Beside the stairs are the restrooms for this floor. Now, as we walk around this corner to the right, this large room on the left is the Audio Visual Resource Centre. You can come here if you wish to listen to a tape or watch one of the library's videos. Next to the Audio Visual Resource Centre is the photocopying room. There are 15 copiers for student use, and we've recently added a colour copier. The system for copying uses cards, not coins. You can buy a photocopy card from the technician in charge of the photocopying room, or from the information desk if he isn't here at the time. On our right, these work tables are for student use, especially for small groups to work together or you and your colleagues can use the conference room, which is that small room there next to the lockers. You can work on group projects in the conference room without disturbing anyone, and there's a conference room on each level of the library. The round desk in front of the lockers is the information desk. If you need help using the catalogues, or you need to organise a loan from another library, the information desk is the place to come. And finally, here, beside the exit doors, these two shelves contain current magazines and journals. Like the newspapers, they are kept here for a time and then stored elsewhere. OK, that's the end of the tour of this level of the library. 
I'll leave you to look around yourselves now, and if you need any further help, please ask at the information desk. That is the end of part two. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between an interviewer and a professor. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Today, I'm here with Professor Nitik, who is our new university president. He has been a professor for twenty years and teaches many of the best classes on campus. I know many of you have had him as a teacher and know of his brilliance. Good morning, Professor Nitik. Thank you for stopping by the student station. Thank you for having me here. It is always great to get to meet many of the students who are involved with our school. I haven't been here since two years ago. Yes, I remember at that time you were still teaching every semester. Two years later, you are only teaching every once in a while. But it seems like you are still always busy. The administration world is just as busy as the teaching world for you. How do you stay in touch with the university, even with the change in your everyday duties? I try to stay in touch with what is popular with the university students. I usually spend time with as many students as I can. They usually give me insight into what the new concerns and beliefs are for the new generation. On top of that. I try to be as youthful as I can. I consider myself to be youthful, at least for my age. So I always have a good time and try to stay young. I try my best to not just be a teacher, but also participate in university life. Interesting. So, are you still doing lots of academic work, or are you mostly concentrating on administrative affairs? Well, I mostly do administrative affairs now. But that doesn't mean that I still don't have a very deep interest in academic matters. I often visit other campuses around the world and meet other professors in my field. I learn the most by travelling and seeing the different places of the world and the different fields of thought. I even did a television program last month in Manchester. Will you be on television any time soon, then? Well, you can call the television station and see if I will be on television any time soon. Maybe I will be on the news report. I don't think it is really that significant, though. Oh, really? That sounds great. I will remember to look out for you. Let's move on. With all your busy travelling recently, how do you find time for your personal life? I try to keep my university life separate from my personal life. Sometimes it's hard to find time to just take my wife and three kids out for a family dinner, but usually we all manage to get together every few days. I'm taking a few weeks off next month to take my family down to South America to Brazil for a few days. I can't wait to just sit on the beach. Wow, that sounds like a wonderful trip, Professor Nitik. Could you tell the audience a little about what goes on in an average day of a university administrator? <laughs> an average day? Oh, I don't think there is such thing as an average day for me. The last few weeks I've been travelling all the time. I can be in Los Angeles in the morning and in New York by the afternoon, and back to Los Angeles by the evening. Sometimes I will spend the whole week at a new university, showing the new administrators the ins and outs of running a university. Sometimes I can spend the whole day in the office on the phone. So there really is no average day for me. I guess that is because I do so many different tasks. Sorry to let all the viewers down, but that is the plain truth. Now look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. Well, I guess I can sum it up for them. You are a busy man. That is probably a good description. So, are there any immediate plans for the coming few weeks? Well, I'm in Los Angeles for the next two days, and then I fly to Colorado to meet a new prospective professor for our university. I will be in Colorado for about a week. Then I go to Japan for the next ten days to meet with our university branch in Japan about record sales there. 
After that, I returned to Los Angeles for a week, just in time for the graduation of the class of 2001. There you have it, my next month's schedule. Thank you very much, Professor Nitik. I always enjoy having you on our show. We hope to have you back on our show next time. That is the end of part three. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty one to forty. Now, listen carefully and answer questions thirty one to forty. I'd like to talk about the changes to our leisure time, and I'll start by talking about lifestyle changes over recent years for women. As we all know, the wife and mother of the family has traditionally been responsible for organising and completing household tasks for the family. However, particularly over the last decade or so, we have seen a greater number of women continuing to work after marriage and returning to work after having children. This has significantly reduced the amount of time available for household chores. The result is that nowadays the majority of people own and regularly use products such as dishwashers or microwaves. The modern family often considers hours spent on cleaning and cooking as a waste of valuable time, and generally we are all interested in finding ways of reducing the number of hours we need to devote to such tasks. While washing machines have long been thought of as necessities by families, nowadays so too are microwaves and dishwashers. These goods can drastically reduce the amount of time we need to spend running our home, and increase the amount of time available not only to go to work, but also to spend on leisure pursuits. As society develops and we become richer, we put more value on our leisure time and our possessions. The richer a society, the more demanding it becomes. People are no longer happy to work long hours for little return. Expensive holidays, expensive clothes, and cars all become more important the more materialistic the society in which we live. Acquiring things and joining the race of acquisition means that modern society spends a lot of time and money purchasing unnecessary goods. Although expensive and persuasive marketing techniques are partly responsible, the demand for such goods often comes from young professionals. Those with the money to endlessly upgrade things simply because a better model is made available. Our obsession with the newest and best products available, while good for the economy, can also have a negative impact on the environment. It is not appropriate to overproduce appliances and overuse electricity to keep these unnecessary appliances operating in our homes. We often forget about the damage we have done to and continue to do to the environment. Others opposed to the overuse of appliances and technology also argue that, from a social point of view, over reliance on gadgets means that people are losing the ability to be creative. Traditionally, it was considered an enviable skill to prepare meals night after night for our families. Nowadays, women are more likely to gain approval from others for their success in their careers than their ability in the kitchen. Along with microwaves, have come ready-cooked meals, pre-washed vegetables, and our reliance on takeaway food when we are too busy to cook it ourselves. While there are obvious advantages and disadvantages to our increasingly active buying behaviour and changing wants and desires, it is likely that our desire to purchase labour-saving items will continue. So it is therefore inevitable that production of such goods will increase. We can only hope to educate ourselves and our children to buy goods we need, not just goods that are available, and we must also consider their environmental impact. In short, moderation is the most important word for the future. I thank you very much for coming today and listening. That is the end of part four.